good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> uh, can, I, can I just remind everybody it's Chatham House Rules as usual? That is, that the uh, statements are on the record and the questions and answers later are off the record. <clears throat> Excuse me. Could I ask, also ask everybody to turn off their phones or put them on silent? Um, we have a, a very interesting topic today, a new disarmament agenda, ensuring a safer and more secure world. I think we would all agree it's not quite as safe or secure as we would like it to be, and that the uh, multilateral system is not as robust as we would like it to be. We have an excellent keynote uh, speaker who will start off the discussion and will be followed then by a response. Izumi uh, Nakamitsu has a very distinguished academic career in Japan before she came to the United Nations, where she has worked in a very broad range of areas, including peacekeeping, uh, UNDP, um, policy and planning, I think, also. Uh, but she en ended up with the, probably one of the most important jobs of the system, which is Under Secretary General and High Representative in the Disarmament Affairs area. She will talk to us about the Secretary-General's uh, new programme, his agenda for disarmament, which attempts to mainstream disarmament issues throughout the UN system and attempts in a very imaginative way to relaunch uh, the disarmament agenda in the global international community. Uh, after Izumi, Orla Fitzmaurice, who is the Director for Disarmament Affairs in the Department of Foreign Affairs, will outline Ireland's response to the agenda and also Ireland's priorities in the disarmament field at the moment. Sumi, would you like to start off, please? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary, for, for that exceedingly kind introduction. Um, I was very, very much looking forward to this opportunity to visit Dublin. Uh, it's not the first time, actually. Um, I have been here before uh, when I was working for peacekeeping, um, but um, it's, it's a real pleasure for me to uh, come to this country, which is one of the strongest supporters, I would say, uh, of uh, multilateralism, uh, and uh, in particular, uh, disarmament field. Um, what I'm going to do today is, uh, of course, briefly to touch on the Secretary General's uh, agenda for disarmament, which was launched uh, last year, um, in May, in fact, um, which is composed of uh, uh, four pillars, disarmament to um, save humanity, disarmament that saves lives, um, the second pillar is about uh, humanitarian consequences of uh, largely conventional weapons, and disarmament for future generations, uh, which is about impact or mitigating the impact of new science and technology uh, on international peace and security, uh, and uh, a partnership for disarmament. Um, this is about uh, uh, strengthening or reinforcing um, common people really understanding disarmament as part of their own agenda. We need new partnership. Uh, women um, um, more represented in the discussions, the youth population also taking these uh, issues as their own. Um, so this is the, uh, broadly uh, uh, the Secretary General's agenda uh, for disarmament, and, and Ireland, again, has uh, stepped forward uh, very forcefully to uh, become a, a strong supporter of a couple of uh, action points. Um, and. and um, we are in a, a difficult uh, situation at the moment when it comes to uh, um, international uh, peace and security. So I would like to take uh, uh, one element of the um, uh, disarmament agenda and focus perhaps on the most acute areas mainly related to nuclear disarmament. Um, there is a sense that uh, perhaps a, a new vision is required, a new approach is uh, required uh, in order for us to move uh, forward or closer to the total elimination of nuclear weapons. Uh, what does the strategic stability look like in, in today's world that has really changed um, um, in, in the past uh, couple of years, I would say? 
so I wanted to uh, uh, talk about, um, with a question mark, a new vision for arms control, question mark. Uh, this is the beginning of a discussions. I'm starting to hear many uh, uh, experts, uh, many political figures, especially in this part of the world, Europe, um, starting to say that perhaps there is a new vision that is required. So I would like to uh, focus uh, on this particular element of the SG's uh, um, um, disarmament agenda. And I could not think of any better country than Ireland to, to talk about this. Uh, as you know, of course, uh, Republic of Ireland is historically one of the strongest supporters of uh, uh, disarmament. Um, and of course, Ireland's uh, um, dedication uh, ranges from that very famous uh, um, uh, resolution, Irish resolution uh, of 1961, which led us all to the uh, creation of the uh, uh, Treaty on Non-Proliferation um, non of Nuclear Weapons, NPT, uh, and of course, more recently in 2017, um, you are um, one of the mothers and fathers uh, of the uh, uh, Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Um, so you are a strong figure uh, in nuclear disarmament, and I could not think of any better country to, to actually uh, talk about this issue. Um, as of now, as we talk uh, and move uh, towards the 2020 review conference of the MPT, uh, Ireland as a, a member and a chair, in fact, uh, coming up uh, of the new agenda coalition, um, Ireland is really a, a leading country uh, to help achieve success through, if you will, bridge building between uh, sharply divided positions uh, of the MPT uh, review conference. Um, I am also, I have to um, talk about this, I'm also really impressed by your leadership role uh, in achieving gender uh, parity, gender equality in international security and disarmament uh, uh, um, meetings and, 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 and activities. Uh, you are uh, uh, one of the strongest supporters of our work also in that regard, and, and, and I wanted to put on record that the United Nations is really uh, um, very grateful uh, for a very uh, diverse areas of leadership uh, which your country, in fact, uh, demonstrates uh, at the international platform. Um, I think the UN um, was created first and foremost, um, to, um, um, to fulfill the mandate that was given uh, in the preamble of the UN Charter, which is to save succeeding generations from scores of war. And obviously for the UN, uh, we strive to play a role in the efforts um, to uh, achieve this goal by seeking the abolition of weapons of mass destruction, most importantly, of course, the nuclear weapons, uh, but also facilitating the strict uh, regulation of conven conventional arms uh, in accordance with, of course, the principles of the Charter and ensuring that innovations in science and technologies are not used in ways that are, uh, that are harmful uh, to us uh, in contravention with international law, including international humanitarian law and in human rights law. Uh, and that's why we made the Secretary General's agenda for disarmament. Unfortunately, uh, creating uh, a safer and more secure world is one, of the, is one that is increasingly difficult. Uh, throughout the nearly 75 years of the UN's history, the world has experienced really warring uh, periods of instability and turbulence. Um, I believe that now, uh, due to a variety of factors that I will touch on briefly, uh, we are on the um, um, uh, verge of an especially uh, dangerous era. Um, it is an era which the potential use of nuclear weapons, either intentionally, uh, through accident or miscalculation, is higher than it has been since the darkest days of the uh, uh, Cold War. The web of uh, agreements, uh, instruments, and arrangements that make up the disarmament, non-proliferation, and arms control regime is being eroded uh, in front of our eyes, and the brakes on armed uh, conflict is being removed in front of our eyes. 
as Secretary General Guterres said to the Conference on Disarmament uh, in Geneva earlier this year in February, key components are collapsing and there is potential for contagion across the entire regime. Yet while the current regime is under threat, there is not as yet, obviously, anything to replace it. The prospect of world without control over nuclear weapons is a potentially catastrophic one. I think we all agree. For the first time since the 1970s, in fact, we could be facing a world without any constraints on those states that possess nuclear weapons if the New START treaty is not going to be extended. So addressing this dire situation should be a global priority. But a solution will not be found in adhering to a business-as-usual approach. To paraphrase the Secretary General, um, what is needed is a new vision for disarmament, perhaps, non-proliferation and arms control, one that is capable of <coughs> tackling the challenges of our time today. And the challenges we face today are a result of multiple interlinked uh, factors. And let me just mention three. First, the international security environment is now characterized by an absence of trust, the militarization of international affairs, and lack of dialogue. Relations between so-called great powers, including those that are nuclear armed, are deteriorating into openly hostile behavior that we observe in front of our eyes. Unprecedented defense spending, blurred lines between conventional and strategic forces, and the proliferation of advanced weapons systems are increasing the risk of armed conflict. The rules-based international order is being challenged by the failure to implement existing obligations and the abrogation of others. Finally, the concept of strategic stability, um, essentially defined as mutual vulnerability during the Cold War and its aftermath, is being undermined in favor of efforts to secure lasting strategic dominance. Second, the global nuclear order is now multipolar. Nuclear diets, even triads, are dangerously linked to regional crisis and could drag in other nuclear armed states. And we had a very concrete and dangerous examples uh, in the recent past in, in uh, Kashmir. After decades of efforts to reduce the numbers, risks and salience of nuclear weapons, the progress has stalled and probably may even be going backwards. Instead of a Cold War um, quantitative, quantitative arms race based on numbers, uh, we now face a qualitative one uh, based on weapons that are faster, stealthier, and also more accurate. And the development of uh, a nuclear, new nuclear capabilities is coupled with uh, dangerous rhetoric, promoting the false assumption, I would argue, that the nuclear war can be controlled or even won. Third, the world is in the midst of a technological revolution. Developments in information and communications technologies, artificial intelligence, sensors, robotics, and computing power are rapidly transforming every aspect of our daily lives. However, those um, same innovations also have the potential to radically alter conventional arms balances, increase prospects of armed conflict, and undermine nuclear stability. For example, networked-enabled warfare uh, opens up the possibility that command and control systems could be hacked including by third parties with malicious intent. Data analysis coupled with advanced sensor arrows uh, or uncrewed swarms could expose previously hidden second strike capabilities. Uh, 
possibly creating use it or um, lose mentalities regarding those capabilities. Existing concerns about attribution for cyber attacks, huge issues, and offensive cyber capabilities and what constitutes an appropriate um, response to those uh, would become even more complicated with the addition of potentially nuclear consequences. An AI produced so-called deep fake in the nuclear context, that is the potential to fool command and control structures or early warning systems could be really catastrophic. The development of weapon systems, such as those that can maneuver at hypersonic speeds, that is six times the speed of sound, designed to evade defensive systems, will further increase anxieties about vulnerability, promoting responses in kind. So those new technologies could incite the type of destabilizing arms racing uh, that characterized the Cold War, Meanwhile, the current lack of transparency encourages states to pursue risky application uh, simply to keep up uh, with the Joneses. So taken together, those uh, factors, um, they have created a combustible international situation that increasingly threatens our collective security. In such an environment, the need for a new approach is probably clear. The question is, what will it look like? This is a big question that is starting to be asked, and we know it would take some time to articulate. I would like to suggest five elements to consider for such a new approach, looking from the UN's point of view, but before that, I would like to touch on three things that should guide our thinking process. So to begin with, um, it must acknowledge the lessons of the past and the great gains made in preventing nuclear war. These gains were hard won and in many cases remain valuable pillars of international security today. Let us not throw them away while we consider a new approach. For example, and to flip Shakespeare, I come not to bury the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, but to <laughs> praise it. <laughs> Extending that treaty to all states that possess uh, intermediate range missiles is something that should be explored, and it's been talked about uh, for a couple of years now. Um, but it should not come at the expense of existing benefits, especially given the two most relevant parties hold some 90% of a nuclear global uh, nuclear arsenal. In the same vein, all efforts should be ex exerted to extend New START, which maintains not only caps on the world's uh, most dangerous weapons, but also the strict verification measures that help provide a basis for confidence in compliance. In the agenda for disarmament, uh, securing our common future, the Secretary General highlighted um, some of the unfulfilled uh, building blocks, if you will, for a world free of nuclear weapons that could help both advance the goal and strengthen global security. The entry into force of the uh, Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty and the negotiation of a treaty prohibiting the production of fissile material for nuclear weapons are two long overdue instruments uh, in, uh, in danger of being thrown in the too hard basket. The opposite is required. We must redouble our efforts to achieve those goals. I also do not believe the bilateral arms control process between the United States and the uh, Russian Federation has run out of runway, with some 90% of the world's uh, stockpile between them. Um, there remains a need for further reductions in strategic weapons by the two largest possess possessors. I know it is possible because I have heard military experts uh, from those countries say that it is possible with political will. 
Beyond these instruments, any regime um, must be based on the fundamental principles developed during the nuclear age, namely the norm of non-use of nuclear weapons and the understanding that the only way to eliminate the threat posed by nuclear weapons is to eliminate nuclear weapons themselves. In other words, a world free of nuclear weapons is the goal we must continue to exert all efforts to achieve. This is my second key principle uh, in search for a new approach, process-wise. Striving to preserve the gains of the existing order is important, but failing to recognize that new challenges and dynamics require new thinking uh, will be the diplomatic equivalent of sticking our heads in the sand. So third, in light of uh, the challenged environment, perhaps a first step could be to develop a common understanding of the new risks that we face and how they interact with existing concerns. Risk reduction is a broad term it means different things in different contexts, especially in regional context. Similarly, a better understanding of and also agreement on the potential consequences of technological developments, including the unintended consequences, could help states agree on ways to minimize challenges in the, in the area while maximizing the benefits of science and technology. Obviously, there are many questions about what is needed. There is also uh, no one panacea to all our problems, and therefore, uh, no reason why multiple initiatives cannot move forward in parallel. With those said, there are five issues that I believe states should take into account when considering an appropriate framework and new approach to arms control and disarmament in the new uh, and current context. First, because several nuclear armed states continue to grow their arsenals, and as nuclear-capable delivery systems become not only more dangerous, but also more numerous and more available, a solitary bilateral arms control process will not be sustainable for much longer. All states that possess nuclear weapons should be engaged in a dialogue on first, how to reduce nuclear danger, and second, to develop the immediate steps uh, that will get us back on a common path to a world free of nuclear weapons. Numbers will continue to be important, that is numbers of arsenals, but might not be the only factor. The concept of what constitutes a strategic weapon might need to be reconsidered. As has been noted in some nuclear equations, intermediate range missiles are in fact strategic. Questions that we should be asking ourselves include, are regional specific arrangements appropriate? Can caps on development of uh, specific delivery vehicles be instituted? Can those weapons traditionally considered non-strategic be brought into broader arms control agreement and arrangements? This non-strategic issue is important for two reasons. First, because regional nuclear crises show how dangerous these uh, weapons can be when it comes to issues such as escalation. And then second, because there are currently no constraints on their development. My second point about a possible new vision for arms control relates to the new challenges posed by a qualitative arms race. It is possible to limit numbers, but constraining the quality of weapons is more difficult. Yet reducing and eliminating the risks posed by especially destabilizing categories of weapons is a critical step in taking the world back from a brink of armed conflict. Take, for example, the deployment of so-called hypersonic weapons. 
I do not believe that the uh, genie is out of the bottle yet, I hope, on these uh, inherently dangerous weapons. If an outright ban is not feasible at this stage, possible options should include a test ban, for example, or mechanisms for increasing transparency around their deployments to avo avoid ambiguity about their purpose, that is, whether they are carrying conventional or nuclear warheads. Third, the international community should consider how to show up any new regime against the potential vulnerabilities exposed by uh, advances in technology. I fully support existing processes aimed at further deploying, uh, developing normative frameworks to secure and stabilize cyberspace, and I, I spend a lot of time working on this, and to ensure that the AI, artificial intelligence, is used in ways that are consistent with international law and does not increase the possibility of armed conflict. However, to date, existing processes have not yet addressed concerns about how technological innovations can potentially increase the, the chances of nuclear detonation. States should examine what transparency and, and confidence building measures or political initiatives can be developed to avoid these terrible linkages, terrible outcomes. These could include more transparency about offensive cyber capabilities and politically binding, at least at this stage, instruments prohibiting interference with nuclear command control structures or early, early warning systems. The fourth issue any future regime will need to address and this is controversial, is ballistic missile defense. No development in arms control um, has uh, appended a strategic pos uh, stability in the way that BMD has. It seems that despite the nascent capabilities uh, in this sphere, fears about future deployments really run deep. So key questions include whether it is impossible to introduce enough transparency to counter the fear or whether an offensive defensive balance can be included in future arms control agreements. My final and fifth and final issue uh, that a future regime could consider is the problem of blurred lines between strategic and conventional capabilities, including through the proliferation of missiles and the uh, myriad uh, potential ways in which recent te technological develop developments will affect future capability. During the Cold War, nuclear weapons were effectively quarantined or sealed from all other weapons. Is this possible anymore? Do future arms control, disarmament, and non-proliferation agreements that involve nuclear weapons also have to consider conventional capabilities, let alone emerging capabilities in nascent domains such as space, outer space, and cyber? Could we, for example, look at a package of measures legally binding instruments mixed with political commitments and confidence building measures. Regardless of how new, a new vision is elaborated, two elements will be essential for the success of any regime, and those are trust and compliance. The two go hand in hand, but the latter fees the former and the needs to be both verified and enforced. Verification of nuclear disarmament is a priority for many states, and there are multiple initiatives making progress on this issue. And they are endeavors we should all support or continue to support. I've spent some time um, talking about potential dangers posed by technology, uh, but I also want to really emphasize 
that the technological uh, revolution can assist us also in seeking a safer and more secure world. We should engage with the creators of those innovations to seek their help in finding those uh, um, solutions. How, for example, can we use AI for verification? How can we verify software as well as hardware? Trust would not be built through verifications alone. It requires real dialogue, and it requires uh, rebuilding habits, uh, rebuilding of habits of cooperation, and I think that is uh, really essential. Strategic dialogue that considers the effects of developments in domains such as space and cyber should be a priority. We need to understand the enormous impact of these domains on strategic stability. Technical discussions are useful, and they are continuing, but we also need um, dialogue at a more strategic level, and we continue to encourage uh, member states to return to it. A new regime will also need a new and different voices, and this is my uh, final points. I've already mentioned the need to engage with industry, but a new generation of arms controllers and disarmers must be nurtured to meet the challenges of the 21st century, including through understanding the lessons of the past. As the Secretary General Guterres is uh, fond of saying, uh, these are future peacemakers, and they are the ultimate force for change. Finally, in any uh, new vision needs to foster a return to understanding that disarmament, non-proliferation, and arms control are not end in themselves. They are the key measures to create a safer and more secure world. They are essential conflict prevention, reduction, and resolution mechanisms that should be really intrinsic to any peacemaking uh, and peacebuilding processes. So I apologize, I've asked more questions than given answers today, but I came here to seek your views in, in finding that, uh, those answers. I hope that um, at least I have uh, provided some food for thought um, and call to action. Um, we cannot afford delay. I think uh, we really uh, urgently return to a, a more serious thinking um, on those issues because I feel very strongly that the stakes are too high, not just for us, but also for our children and, and our grandchildren. Thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to your answers. Uh, well, Izumi, thank you very much. You, you frightened us, um, <laughs> yes. frightened me anyway. But you also, I think, uh, gave a lot of hope there. Uh, you gave a sense that the United Nations is uh, playing the role it should play in stimulating discussion and identifying issues and in providing solutions which are a threat to no one. And while you spoke of um, uh, a new vision, I think the emphasis you put on that being a shared vision was much to be welcomed. Um, Orla will now speak. I think you, want, you will sit here um, on Ireland's overall response. Uh, to the agenda. Sure, and thank you, and uh, thank you, Azumi. It's, uh, it's really wonderful to have the opportunity to discuss disarmament in Ireland. Um, we spend a lot of time talking about it on the international stage, but actually we don't do a lot of, um, or have a lot of opportunities to discuss it within, uh, with, within our own four walls. Um, so we're very pleased to be, to be invited to be part of this discussion. Um, disarmament is one of Ireland's five signature foreign policies set out in our foreign policy statement. Um, the people in this room probably know the other four, so I won't list those as well. But um, it's, I suppose, one of the questions we look at sometimes is what does it mean to be a signature foreign policy? What is, you know, why have we, why have we selected that as one of our policies? Where did it come from, and what does that mean going forward? Um, one of my predecessors identifies it as. Um, uh, you know, a blessing and a, and a challenge. Um, it's like inheriting the most beautiful vase and you need to make sure at the very least you don't break it on your watch and that you can hand it over to the next, uh, uh, the next generation, um, hopefully improved or burnished. Um, 
So within that context, we are very lucky in that we benefit from a long history of political support for the work that we do on disarmament. It's been very consistent across governments and is featured in, program, in successive programs for government, um, including in, in the present one. Um, but again, that doesn't really answer the question why. Um, by some measures, I suppose, our nuclear diplomacy should in fact be vanishingly small. We don't have nuclear weapons, we don't have uranium mines, we don't have um, nuclear energy in our power mix. So why we are invited to be part of the discussions um, at the highest levels with, with the countries who are you know, objectively the most powerful in the world is, isn't obvious. Um, but it comes back to our legacy over decades um, of engagement and of consistent, persistent diplomacy in this field. Um, the very first resolution adopted in the UN was the establishment of a commission to deal with the problem raised by the discovery of atomic energy. Um, unfortunately, I think we haven't yet uh, finished dealing with the problem discovered um, or by, raised by the discovery of atomic energy. And in, you know, that obviously remained unfinished business when we joined the UN in 1955. And at that time, in the, in the context of the Cold War, um, we, were, uh, we were in a challenging place. Um, it, our accession at that time coincided with a massive increase in the number of nuclear weapons held by the United States and the USSR and a deepening of the tensions um, by, by acquisition of, of nuclear weapons by the other members of the P5, ultimately. Um, but, so, there were, so there was a push factors in some way, but probably the most decisive factor in our engagement was Frank Aiken, the then Minister for Foreign Affairs. Quite what drew him to, to nuclear diplomacy isn't exactly clear, um, but it seems to be pretty evident that it was linked with his role in, um, in seeing warfare on this island and the, in, in the role that he played in the War of Independence and the Civil War and understanding the consequences, um, as Atsumi has laid out, um, for humanity of the most destructive, you know, of, of warfare in the conventional sense in the early 20th century was sufficiently destructive for warfare in the atomic age be. Um, so he was driven to assert a more positive version of Irish neutrality at that time um, to try and bridge or stop some of the deepening of divisions um, within the Cold War. And that led to the Irish resolutions that, uh, that, that Izumi has outlined, um, which ultimately became the foundations of the non Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the NPT, um, which will be celebrating its 50th anniversary next year. Um, we are very supportive of the NPT. It remains absolutely the cornerstone of our engagement and the cornerstone of the, of the international disarmament and non-proliferation regime. Um, more recently, we have been extremely active in the negotiation of the Treaty on Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons um, in 2017, where Ireland was one of the core group members there and played a vital role in that negotiation. We see it as giving effect to the disarmament obligations in the NPT to ensuring that disarmament isn't just an issue, just, or the, you know, the effective outworking of the Article, Article 6 um, obligations on disarmament aren't just a discussion between those states that have weapons, they also have a responsibility to the rest of us, that we have a legitimate interest in being part of this conversation and that we have, um, that the international community has momentum and has an energy to, to drive that forward. So for that reason, we were one of the leading countries uh, proposing the treaty. We were one of the leading countries in the negotiation of it. And if you look at it, you will see our fingerprints on, on quite a bit of it, um, particularly the uh, gender dimensions, the recognition of the um, disproportionate impact of nuclear weapons use on women and girls, um, the recognition of the need for full and effective participation of women and men in disarmament discussions at all levels. Uh, there's a phrase we see a lot in disarmament and it always makes me laugh because it's something like, you know, encouraging the participation of both women and men. And in my experience, that's two women and all of the men. So <laughs> it's um, both of them there. Um, but um, it's, I think it's, it's the changing face of disarmament discussions and the diversity um, that we've been encouraging is something that's... Um, that can give hope to this, to the new vision, to the new way of thinking, to a new way of of of, um, of engaging, and it's not just something that we're uh, we're not promoting gender perspectives just simply because it's the right thing to do. We know from our experience in Northern Ireland and peace building on our island that having all of the voices included, particularly having women's voices included, is is incredibly important. Um, beyond the gender issue, which is obviously very, uh, a, a very important priority for us within the TPNW also, um, the Irish delegation at the time was very 
uh, centrally involved in negotiating some of the tricky issues around um, accession pathways or around victim assistance and environmental remediation provisions. So you'll see it's a very holistic treaty. It's not looking at disarmament purely as a disarmament or purely even as a security issue. It's addressing the, the environmental impacts. It's addressing the developmental impacts. Um, and we're at the stage now where the treaty has not yet entered into force. It will require 50 ratifications to enter into force. Um, work is underway on the Irish ratification. Um, the Tónishta is hoping to publish a bill um, in the summer programme, and that will be considered by the Oireachtas uh, later in 2019. And we'd hope to be in a position to ratify shortly thereafter. Um, so we are... You know, we are very pleased to be part of the conversations. We're very pleased to be the first to hear the new vision that you have set out. Um, there's a lot of scope, I think, for for, for navigating um, new paths between between some of the between some of the um, some of the challenges there. And our contribution on disarmament, I think, isn't just limited to nuclear weapons, or that we don't look at just purely at nuclear issues. Um, we, you know, people in this room will, will know well that we played a, a leadership role in the anti-personnel. Um, Anti-Personnel Landmine Convention, which will be celebrating its 20th um, anniversary of entry into force later in the year. Um, the Cluster Munitions Convention, of course, was um, was negotiated under the leadership of Thayo Kali, who'd be well known to, to everybody in this house. Um, and behind all of these, what's consistent in all of these engagements, I think, really is the recognition of the indiscriminate, disproportionate, enduring effects of these type of weapons. Um, which which incur a cost that cannot be that is not acceptable to us as an international community. Um, you know we we are increasingly trying to situate disarmament beyond the purely beyond the purely technical to integrate it into the into the SDGs to integrate it into our development policy and so on. If you look at the 2030 agenda for development, you won't find the word disarmament in there anywhere. Um, but it's certainly a key enabler. Um, because a nuclear detonation in any populated city in the world would not allow us to achieve any of the goals that we want for 2030. Um, and equally, progress on, on conventional disarmament is equally important um, to do that. So when we launched, our, when we prepared our new um, uh, international development policy earlier this year, um, A Better World, uh, I was very pleased to see that we were able to secure disarmament um, and our work on disarmament and its links to development in there. Um, we've made it on page three, which is pretty high up, I think, as it goes. Unfortunately, not quite, not quite the first page, but you know, it's it's a commitment to to what we're doing. And equally, one of the first outworkings of the of the Better World policy has been an agenda for small island developing states, or a strategy for a national strategy for small island developing states, launched by the Thunersta very very recently. Where within that, we also address. Um, remediation for the effects of nuclear weapons testing in a lot of the Pacific states as well and that we'll be looking to see how we can how we can um, assist to the uh, the remediation there um, so beyond that our priorities right now um, in champion in, in are very strongly linked to the making the UN processes work as best as uh, you know, as much as we can and um, very much supporting the UN Secretary General's agenda on disarmament and encouraging our European colleagues to do likewise and um, we've specifically identified three key actions where we have um, ha have um, with the status of championing um, first action on a dialogue for nuclear disarmament and in particular we'll be looking to take that forward when we chair the new agenda coalition next year which is a particularly important year for the nuclear non-proliferation treaty the new agenda coalition is a small cross-regional grouping and um, that focuses very heavily on disarmament it includes um, ourselves brazil egypt mexico south africa and new zealand so as you can see a very diverse and cross-regional grouping um, we're also looking very heavily at um, Action 14 in the agenda on explosive weapons in populated areas because we're deeply concerned about the causes of humanitarian need. And again, that fits in with our, with our new development policy approach where we're moving from meeting humanitarian need to addressing the causes of humanitarian need. And we look forward to hopefully um, progressing work on a political declaration in that and hosting a Dublin event sometime in 2020 um, to, to allow states um, agree a political declaration there. And finally, we're championing Action 21 of the agenda, which brings together um, its arms control for conflict management and which looks at drawing on our experiences of Northern Ireland, including our experience in decommissioning, um, 
to address conflict prevention, conflict management, conflict resolution. Equally looks to bring in our work on, 13, on um, the UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security, where we're seeking to bring a gender perspective to, um, to conflict management and to address issues. You know, uh, sometimes the challenge is gender is seen as women and girls. It's, you know, it's seen as, I think we're looking to expand that conversation to ensure issues like harmful forms of masculinities are, are included there and that we're looking to bring experiences that we've had um, to an arms control focus. So it's a fairly, um, a fairly broad remit, but I think through it all is the, um, is the commitment that um, I think the, the Secretary General has previously said the phrase about there are no right hands for the wrong weapons, and that while we accept that you know, in this world we're going to have conflict um, situations, that, is not, that, that cannot be without its limits, and that cannot be in a way that affects the future of our planet, that cannot be in a way that it disproportionately affects the, the communities in which we live or the communities in which people in conflict zones live and that there has to be some, some governance, some framework around there. So it's been, um, it's a, it shouldn't be a priority issue, but it has always been a priority issue and we're, I think we're very, very lucky, or I feel very, very lucky to work in this area and to be able to have Ireland's voice as part of that conversation.